So hi everybody, welcome back. My name is Dev Raj, and I'm very excited today to have on my channel Pavita, Pavita Machado. Uh, maybe I'm pronouncing that right, or maybe not, but um, yeah. I know Pavita anyway, but like, from Brazil. And uh, someone I actually, uh, a therapist I actually remember from many years ago when I was doing therapist training in Holland, she would be running some workshops there. And that's where I first experienced bioenergetics. And I didn't really like it at the time, but um, later on I could see that it was doing me a lot of good. And so I, I, I pursued it as well. So um, I'm super excited to have you have you here, Pavita. Thank you so much for coming on. Maybe you'd like just to introduce yourself a bit and, and, and talk about your work. And I know you have an online workshop coming up soon as well, but just chat away, whatever you, you feel like saying. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited too. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, so where to start? Where did I get into this thing that nobody likes at first and <laughs> it's a good idea later? Well, yeah, I did start with the bioenergetics, even though it's not really the only thing I do now, but I still use it a lot because I really see the value of it. But I would say it started really with basketball <laughs> because I was like from the age of seven-ish, I was a child with very little energy in my body. I was very much up in my head. I started school very early and my family was not very encouraging to be in the body because as we both know now, uh, the body is the place where we experience feelings. And there had been so much pain and sorrow in my family history in the beginning and so many deaths and that people coped with by being very busy, working a lot, and then disconnecting in their free times by watching TV or, you know, like just disconnecting from the body. So I grew up in that environment of like, mm, the body is not a very safe place to be. So I always had the worst grades in sports in school. Nobody would ever pick me for, my, for any team until at the age of 13, I decided to learn basketball. And that became like a total passion in my life. And then from one month to the other, I was all about the body. And then I had the best grades in sports and I just was so turned on to life, you know. So that led me to wanting to be a basketball coach because I wasn't very tall to play it. <laughs> so I went into this thread that took me to the University of Physiotherapy, all because of basketball. But then at the university, I was not very happy with the approach they were teaching. They were teaching so much about disease and about treating the disease instead of teaching us why are people creating the, those diseases. So we would treat a patient for him to come back three months later, either with the same thing or another thing, because the cause of that disease was not treated or looked at. So that was always very frustrating to me. And then in my last year of university, I met this couple of therapists who were working with bioenergetics. And then I had my first bioenergetics experience with them, which was a weekend workshop. Hardcore work, really sweaty, strong stuff. But I was so eager for it because I was at that point in my life, I was only 20 years old and everything was working well according to the system i had my boyfriend with whom i was going to get married and we had the name for the first child already and i was going to graduate and have my office and be successful in my work so it's like everything was like the best expected scenario and inside i wasn't feeling enthusiastic about any of that i had the feeling that you know is this all like isn't there anything else in life? And in that first weekend workshop it was like seeing a whole lot of answers to my questions, you know, it was resonating so strong in me and having such a strong impact. I remember this moment of coming out of the shower on Saturday afternoon after the session. And then I passed by a window inside the bathroom and I, I 
went back to see who was that person on the other side of the window, only to realize it wasn't the window, it was a mirror. But I looked so different that I couldn't recognize myself. I looked at my own eyes and I'm like, is this me? I had changed so much in one day of bioenergetic work. So when I went back into the group room, they were all sitting for a sharing. And then the therapist looked at me and said, have you looked in the mirror yet? <laughs> have you seen your eyes in the mirror? And then I realized everybody could see the change. It was really what had happened. And then I came out of that weekend seeing this is what I want to do. And this is what I want to learn to, to do with people. So that's how everything started for me mm. quite a few mm. years ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting. I mean, bioenergetics was very kind of, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I don't know where, like, if anyone ever researches where these things come from. Westerners usually go talk about Wilhelm Reich and Alexander Lowen, but I often have a feeling like, you know, it's coming more from some shamanic root or some, something in South America or something like that, but I don't really know. And I just remember from 20, 25 years ago, it was always hardcore, you know? If you were going to bioenergetics workshop, that was not like some gonna be some nice weekend, you know, with therapy, that was gonna be, <laughs> that was gonna be like some kind of torture, but that was my feeling, you know? And you would always be, oh my God, can I think of an excuse? And I cannot think of an excuse to get out of it, you know? <laughs> there was always this kind of sense of it. And I don't know, I mean, I guess, the way I've been involved with it recently and stuff, it is, has become more soft and 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 also integrated with stuff. And I know, like low in the West, it was like a component. Like with right, it was like you would do psychotherapy and then you would also do you know work with the body and emotions. But do you know anything about the history of it from South America or, or anywhere else? It's very much coming from experience, both from Reich and Lowen. They were very much connected to their own personal experience there's a beautiful uh, biography of Reich called Fury on Earth yes. it's a very thick book yeah. where he talks a lot about his experience and then it's but also with Freud it's like everybody interested in human development is kind of coming from their own human life experience in order to create whatever technique and method they do create and then uh, combining different information so it's like we use a lot the the grounding exercise which you I, I hear you calling the arch and bow other people also call that but then we also know that the people uh, who live in extreme cold the Eskimos of Alaska and the North Pole they use that position in order to raise heat in their bodies so it's like out of experience you know like finding out and uh, Lowen did that a lot, experiment, experimenting with different positions and how he felt in those positions. Mm. And then he's like, ah, okay, this calls up the awareness to that thing and to that other thing. So it's a lot experiential. And, and then they developed very good systems of uh, defining um, techniques, exercises, postures, ways of moving and breathing that brings awareness to specific areas. And there's a lot that can be uh, added to that to, from the recent, more recent years, because Reich is really old and Lowen is also from a long time ago. And then more recent than that, the whole trauma-oriented field has brought a lot of new information which is not totally new, but the awareness of it and the focus brings a lot of different nuances and perspectives to the work with the body. So you say it's becoming softer and, and it's, this is not good or bad because I love all the hard work I've done <laughs> on myself. And also I see that the main thing is not something that the therapist can know about the person. It's like when I'm working with someone, I don't know where the person needs to go. And if I assume that position of, I know what should be happening with you and what you should express. And if I take that position, I disempower this person from the very search for her or himself to find out 
what's going on within. So that's the point where I um, now call my work bio-inquiry, but it's like, what are words anyways? How to define something so much bigger than the words? But like to bring the self-inquiry into the body work creates a whole new dimension in terms of in any position that your body is, what is happening inside right now? And when I propose a position which is intelligently designed to call up awareness to a certain specific area of tension in your body, what is your experience there? And very often in bioenergetics, people connect with feelings that are stuck there because that's what the tension is there for, to protect one from connecting, being conscious of some feeling that is perceived as threatening there. And then once you connect with that feeling, there are many possibilities of ways to go with that feeling. And that's something that in old days wasn't so present in our consciousness so that you have a feeling, scream it out. <laughs> you know that it's like, you feel something, scream it. And, uh, and there's a whole lot of value to screaming. And sometimes that's the possibility. Like I said, it's many possibilities. But basically, it's also learning to navigate feelings and take advantage of what they are trying to tell us. Because basically screaming, crying, throwing tantrums, any toddler can do is no sign of emotional maturity. Mm -hmm. And much less is emotionally mature to repress your feelings. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the funny thing here, because we've been so much repressing the feelings and living so much up here in rationalizing everything that I feel we needed as a humanity to go through this moment of okay unleash the feeling beast that is in you you know it's like so that there's a flow happening again all these feelings held up since i was born in my body i let it out and then i get in the flow not so that i can yell at anybody that upsets me but that i can find what makes sense what is coherent with who i am mm. in terms of dealing with the feelings i'm feeling it's like any anger is telling you that something that is happening with you is not in coherence with your system so it's so important to stop and be aware of the anger rather than shovel it to the unconscious or to throw it out so i feel relieved but not more aware than before. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's whole, I'm, I get so excited talking about this. <laughs> I really think it's so needed, this uh, emotional awareness, not only here, understanding feelings, but experiencing in the body, allowing my full energy to be involved in this wonderful process that we call human life. <laughs> Does it make any sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it also is fascinating, you know, because, I mean, like you, but in a different part of the world, I also lived nearly two decades in, in community, Osho community, spiritual community, and with a lot of people who, you know, you're just exploring all of these things, and they will go through phases when everyone is shouting at everybody because they think that's the right thing to do in the community, you know? you got a little bit of emotion, okay, you amplify it massively, and you hurl it out at the person, but... Of course, it does not really create such a, like you're saying, you know, it doesn't, we need somewhere to release the way the past has a hold on us. But once that's done, it's like developing some maturity and some some presence with people as well, you know, just to be, that, that's what's changed my life the most, I think, in the last five years was, just getting enough stuff out of the way somewhere from internally that I could be more present with myself and with other people and then start to get nourished by that. You know, it's Fantastic. like, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's what my learning kind of came. I had to somehow get, I came from a very traumatic background and I had to, and I was a mess and I, and I had to just go in this washing machine for a while 
and and then at some point it's like okay now i can start to navigate myself in the world okay i don't need even to be in a massive community with everybody hugging each other all the time you know it's nice but I, I, I can get back out into the world and kind of and be real and meet people and see how it goes you know it's like yeah but it's a whole walk to get to that point isn't it like to to be able to make those decisions and the funny thing is like we see the our adult world through the eyes of our conditioned child so we, we end up projecting expectations that were built there every time we got some experience stuck in our body, which is called trauma. And mm. then we see the world through the eyes of trauma. We tend to repeat experiences. We put ourselves into this vicious circle and it feels like how to get out of this. So mm. even our attempts to get out such as we have this experience with therapy and it we feel like this taste of freedom oh that makes me feel so free and then i find this group of people who also experience that and then i engage with that group because i want to belong to a group my little child finally found a family here a new group to which i will belong and who will see me and validate me and value me and all this need for value being valued validated that's all from my child and then i will start acting the same ways so projecting that that is the father who's going to take care of me if i behave the way he likes and if i agree with what the family is thinking and this is so much what I experienced bringing into my experience in communities it was 25 years of being in communities so I saw myself um, proposing going into that direction and then like would just match with whatever place I was living and the people so I was putting myself in that position of being the child and never really taking the space to see me who I am and mm -hmm. come from there but come from what do you need from me what do you want from me now and it's been so many years of that and in those years I was also learning a lot and developing many places of myself but was really by the last years before pandemic hit that I start it started to become very uncomfortable for me that place and I would then go into blaming the place and the others for putting me in that position and inside I knew that wasn't really it you know mm. so but it was only after pandemic hit 2020 that I finally got the guts to look at it and say enough i need some space for myself to figure out all this mess because i really don't like what's happening with me and so i took this time off from the community where i was living and then i was really like sabbatical not working not doing anything else than meditation and the course in miracles which is a practice i like very much and then just throwing myself into meditation for hours every day and being in nature alone that kind of gave me the space to find places of me that I was just completely disconnected from and after a few months of that I was back to such a connection with essence that I was able to go back to the community where I was living and communicate that I felt my time there was over and uh, so much appreciation and gratitude for all I learned there but now it's another direction and that's where my life went from like three years ago to this day and so much has been opening up and being discovered because I'm not hanging on or clinging to any crutches or other people to give me directions and it's like being adult. It's so exciting to be an adult. Everybody yeah. thinks, oh, <laughs> the best days are, no, <laughs> the best days are 
to be adult. You get to be free. You get to be responsible for what happens to you. How exciting is that to create yeah. something new and beautiful in this planet? I love being an adult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it is something like that. The thing is, like, I really feel like, yes, I had to go and live communally for a long time. You know, and I, I used to be squatting before that. I was always communal. But then it was actually for me when I started learning more about Reich and character structure and started to understand the oral character type, I, I realized that like the entire community was, as I perceived it at the time, was composed of people who were very strong in oral character type. And most spiritual communities are, basically. And that was a massive, like, bang on the head for me somewhere that I was still seeking to create the connection I didn't get with my mother because my mother left me when I was a baby you know and so that that wound inside I was just like oh I just need to be in a completely nourishing maternal environment all the time you know and and it wasn't until I actually read a bit, a bit of character structure that 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 kind of belief got challenged you know and, and and things started to change for me but what I'm really trying to say is like I still really consider that I got so much from that time of my life as well you know, for at least 10, 15 years. It's Absolutely. like, yeah. I, I had to almost go back to being a child to become an adult for a long period of time. And I often meet people these days because, I mean, I'm traveling a lot. And then because I had this track channel on YouTube as well, which is looked at by a lot of younger people, you know, people in their twenties and thirties, you know, I end up talking to a lot of people in this age group and they are different. I think from how I was in that age or how I perceived other young people in that age, they generally have less trauma, not always by any means, but the average level of kind of trauma is a bit down, I think certainly in the West, but they still face huge challenges, you know, just with being, having any depth as a human being, you know, and it's like, I don't know, do they need to, I'm, I'm just drifting away a bit here, but like, it's like, do they need to go communal? Do they, it's like so that, that's something I repetitively meet in people in their 20s or 30s, but they are pretty together on a superficial level and they can be quite present, you know, but they, they, there's something about getting any deeper that's really a struggle for them. And so they get caught in all sorts of kind of relationship or life dynamics where they're basically kind of happy, but not really excited or turned on. You know, of and course, like that's the invitation of the moment. And it's like this, I think, actually, when you mean less trauma, I can see the perspective from where you're looking, but I find quite traumatic the exposure to social media today, mm. especially for younger generations, because like we didn't grow up with computers, even mobile phones. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we still get caught in that, but mm. we have a different connection to that. These kids, they... You know, like you go to a restaurant, you see like a toddler with an iPad in front. It's like they are submitted to it like from no age. And then they get sucked by it. And it's so artificial, the experience there. And then like their body image needs to fit what they see on social media and the, mm -hmm. their behavior. And it creates such an, a fantasy world in which they think they should fit and it's coming from the same wish that we both had of fitting in some group and some mm. you know it's like this desire of belonging but then looking into this longing for belonging we go back to a certain um, well everybody has to to find where that takes you each one each person but uh, it connects back with after all i am worth it of belonging i i am legitimate just by being me and the fact that i wasn't born in a family who could see that and value that doesn't take away the legitimacy of that i'm worth it mm -hmm. but it's a, a lifetime or maybe many lifetimes <laughs> work to get to that experience because that can easily be said but experienced in the body in the feeling that i can talk to you and it's like we're talking for the sake of talking not for a goal it's just so enjoyable this moment mm. and when i can enjoy so much 
leading a group for 80 people and seeing transformation happen as much as watering my plants here, they're everywhere and seeing a new sprout coming. It makes me so happy. It's <laughs> like, I'm so present in that moment as I am present in giving an individual session in leading a big group. It's my presence and my connection with the moment that creates the spark in my life. It's not a goal to achieve there, an objective. And that's how we, we're oriented. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the babies get looked at and said, you're going to grow up to be a medical doctor, to be an engineer. You know, <laughs> or you look in social media, oh, I have to have that kind of body, that kind of uh, car or whatever fits my ego. And it's like, yeah, okay, but what's deeper than that who are you really that question who are you really whoa it just opens a space and that's the beauty of self-inquiry it's not about the answer it's about the field of experience that it opens up so this question who am i is not a question to be answered it's a question to be experience to be drunk like to feel coming down your throat and what's the taste of this question in me what does it bring in me right now who am i and it will always have a different fragrance because we're all like we were saying before we're constantly updating <laughs> like the zoom <laughs> we are constantly updating we are alive we are alive and there is no age that ends that. That's very important. As long as we are alive, we're updating. We're changing. So who am I is an invitation to experience this moment. And it's such a beautiful opportunity daily, every moment, you know, to, to full presence. And I feel like the last years with all the trauma oriented work somehow everything that gets discovered uh, has a, um, a threat of being swallowed by the system which invests in us staying up here in our minds and disconnecting from feelings and body because then we're more controllable it's like how can we be controlled by social media, by artificial intelligence, by being predictable? A person who's spontaneous, who's present, is unpredictable. I couldn't prepare what I'm going to talk here with you today because it's coming from the moment. Mm. And that's the beauty of life. We are unpredictable. It's not possible. The artificial intelligence works with predictability so and so that's the thing uh the the threat of falling into that trap of going up here disconnecting from senses from body that needs to be watched we need the connection with the body yes be aware of the trauma structure and there to go in the body and by there i don't mean Push it, be hard on yourself. I, I mean, trust the body. And bioenergetics brings that. You feel your legs, you develop trust in your capacity of sustaining you, of really affording the person who you are on this planet, because you're standing on your two strong legs, which connect to your powerful pelvis powerful there's so much energy there and sexuality so much part of it which is the other thing being very suppressed along like all the possible powers of the human being are a threat to the system so it's like we are not going to avoid them we are whole with all of it and with our hearts it's not a bad idea to be vulnerable to be sensitive to love people 
we, we learn to believe that it's dangerous to love and be sensitive. It's a superpower. We just didn't learn how to develop that, how to trust that. So I feel it's super important to join together all the trauma aware community into this grounding the experience in the body. And yes, using methods and techniques that can access the unconscious tension there and bring it to consciousness so it can be transmuted. Mm. Oh, I talk a lot. Eh? No, I get excited. And I... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. It's, it's passion. Yeah. It's a passion, this, yeah. this subject. <laughs> I mean, what I see, you know, is like with the, the whole trauma-informed thing is like, there's an underlying belief that if you could just get rid of the trauma out of childhood, then people would be fine. But I don't think that's really true. I mean, it's not as simple as that. You know, it's like, so there's a lot of movement in the world, you know, to, to lower the trauma in, 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 in that we're ongoingly taking, which is, you know, I can't argue with that as a humanistic kind of person, but at the same time, there's this kind of belief that if we can just make the whole of the world fair and people aren't getting trauma and they aren't getting you know downgraded because of their skin color or the, their religious beliefs or, or their gender or orientation you know if you can just do all of that then everyone will be fine and I don't agree with that that is true I mean I think it's good to make the world more fair but there is somewhere this inner world and you know, so many billions of people live on the earth and they don't really access it very much, I don't think, you know, because they are just caught up in their minds with all of this stuff. And it's kind of crazy when you look from the outside because someone who is just 55 and getting old and eating or whatever, or some teenager somewhere, you know, that there's this immense inner world inside of them that never really gets accessed. And, and so rich in nuances. So yeah. it's not really about getting rid of trauma, but there is a source of information there. Mm. Because also when we block away trauma, it is the way we find in neurotic normal life to, to get rid of trauma. We get rid. Even yeah. when we get drunk, we get rid of problems for some yeah. time. But it's not really getting rid. It's there and it has information for us. It has precious information. And our idea about what's good and bad is also so tendentious because what is good and bad? When you decide that something is bad and something is good, you are narrowing your window of experience. And that's what we do systematically with our emotions. Like we don't like to feel anger. Usually people don't like to feel anger. And then we suppress it before we become aware of it. In many different ways, disconnecting. We eat our anger. That's one of the favorite ways. Internet is another favorite way of the most, whatever, drugs, any way of disconnecting, rationalizing. So I don't have to go into that. But that anger has information for you. When you push it aside, you miss and you will not gain that intelligence that is hidden there underneath that layer of anger. So basically, we all go through this process of disconnecting from who we are in essence. And then we develop ways of surviving in the world. Going searching for this connection again this reconnection to who we are in essence necessarily will pass through those painful experiences yes it will so it's like when you're on a dead end street the only way out is where you came in except that you don't you are not the same person on your way out that you were on your way in. When you came in, you were a child. You had no resources to deal with all that. And you crossed it and you stayed there in the safe 
bad end street where nothing happens, but you decorate your bad end and paint it very nicely. And then some friends hang out there, but life is not happening there. It's just the fantasy of life because you're in a bad end street. But then in order to get there where life is really happening, there's this scary entrance full of pain and you're like, no ways I'm going to go through that. So you need to learn who you are now. And you need to learn that you are an adult with capabilities of dealing with the feelings, capable of seeing the experience in a different way. So with those resources, you can walk through back to the freedom of where life is happening. Mm. That's the perspective of therapy. But there's yet the perspective of meditation, which is also very much part of my work. And I love very much, which is like, even the dead end street is an illusion. <laughs> so we, it's like, um, we both uh, come from the Osho scene of therapy, where he talked about the psychology of the Buddhas, where he assumes that we, uh, we are all enlightened. We just forgot about it. And then we believe we are like these defect personalities and all that. And that's where we dwell. Mm. But in fact, it's like remembering who you are, which is, by the way, the, the name of this uh, group that I'm starting next week. Remembering, remembering who I am in essence, which might pass through all the dead end places that I put myself in. But it's like in order to retrieve which are real, really my qualities, which are really my aspects, my own connection to source, divine, whatever you want to call it, because there is a connection mm. and meditation brings you into that. So that's why I find so important the dance between therapy and meditation at some point I thought it was like a, a leap from therapy to meditation. And then I learned it's not because, mm. you know, I've had clients who were heavy meditators, like monks for years. And at some point they find an obstacle where their meditation doesn't go deeper than that because there was something stuck in their system, which mm. they have to look through with the help of therapy. So it's a dance, you know, between mm. both, between the vertical expression of life, this world as we see it, and the, the horizontal, sorry, and the vertical, which is my experience of my own connection to source, to spirit, to, you know, God, whatever is the name you want to mm -hmm. give it. But it's mm -hmm. a, a personal, very personal, individual experience. Mm -hmm. And I just love working with that. I just have so much fun doing that so that's why I do it <laughs> and it's always growing and opening up mm. well that's lovely it's good it's that's great I mean I mean I mean maybe you can even just say a little bit more about this workshop I know you have an online workshop starting soon mm -hmm. yeah yeah since the pandemic so much has become online eh? so I started to mm. I started these groups actually two years ago, but I was doing it only in Portuguese. And it was so beautiful because I make it not too big so that I can be present with each participant. And it's, uh, we do body work in bioenergetic exercises, but all with this perspective of self-inquiry during the exercise. And then we explore different themes, which are really provocations just to understand or get some inf inner information, how I relate to that. So how I relate to that, and then how I experience that in my body. What does that bring to consciousness in my body when I get in touch with? And then we also do sharings because it's so precious, this tool of meeting people and then mirroring each other and seeing you I mean you also come from group work that gives such a beautiful expansion to therapy work when you can feel resonance with other people some people 
can show things that you were not aware of, but it touches you. Aha, I also have that. Or um, you being seen and respected. That's so important. Being seen mm -hmm. without a judgment in your vulnerability. That per se is so healing. So healing. I actually find that one of the most healing things present in this work where mm. people listen, really listen to each other. They don't listen to their own judgments while the other is talking, which is what we usually do. We don't hear the person. We hear our own minds going about ah, that. Blah, 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 blah. So when you're present with somebody and you're really listening and noticing what happens in you as you listen, oh boy, that's so precious and rich. So that all happens in these meetings and, and also a lot of space for the unexpected because it comes out of presence. So depending on who is there, it's a whole different game going on. Just the focus is on remembering who you are. That's why I call it remember. And, um, and so there are like two hour more or less meetings where we do all that kind of work. We do some meditation and then we come out of the meeting with some assignment or some activity that you bring into your days to ground whatever was moved and, and happened there. And then people start to relate outside the meetings also. They end up that has always happened and it wasn't like I proposing it they end up creating friendships there because they end up discovering themselves the, taking away what covers the, their selves to each other and that that creates such empathy and wish for closeness so that's a, a bonus of the work the friendships that are created there and I, I'm in love with this process. So now, because I have all these clients in English and I work in different countries, I thought, why not? Let's do it in English. And then the challenge I'm facing is like to have a time that matches Europe, America, Australia, China. Uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Very challenging. But so far, it's going to be on Tuesdays, 7 uh, CET. So 7 p.m. Um, Europe time. Mm. And that some people like China won't make it <laughs> because it's not possible. But so we start with that and let's see how where it goes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. That sounds great. It, sound, it sounds really great. It's exciting to hear, hear from you and hear about how your work has evolved. Pavita. It's, it's, it's great you. to keep going hey, and keep going and keep learning and keep also putting something out from inside of us. You see, I am so curious about life. I've always been searching for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And I don't think I will change that. That is really part of who I am until the end. And I think I will expect death with the same curiosity because yeah. how exciting it is. Death, nobody really knows because... <laughs> <laughs> you have to experience and then you cannot tell anyone it's like, yeah you have like narratives from uh, near-death experience and all that but you know it's so curious and then we create ideas about how things are such as now I'm go I'm about to go into menopause and there's all these assumptions about menopause and I'm just so curious about all these changes in my body and is it going to happen to me that I will feel all this heat? And this all looks to me so exciting. I'm so excited about a new phase in life where my body will go through transformation. I find that super exciting. And then I hear all this narrative of, oh, poor women, we suffer all life with menstruation. And then we suffer. What suffer? It's like, it's a, a matter of personal experience. All the suffering needs to be questioned with deep honesty. And then some information will be there. Mm -hmm. And then transmutation can happen. So whatever suffering needs to be questioned. Nobody's here to suffer. No 
body is in this planet to suffer. It's not possible. It doesn't make sense that we are put here to suffer. But there's information in there. Everything that happens to us has certain content and some treasures hidden in there. I'm not somebody who didn't suffer. Oh boy, I know that. I know that part of, of life. And, and that, that makes me very human, having gone through many different hardships. And I found so many treasures in each of them, really. It's like this, this first experience of the death of my father when I was four years old brought me in touch with such a thirst for what in life is more reliable than even the life experience itself because a person that you love the most just disappears like that so what is it that is not going to disappear spiritual search started at the age of four mm -hmm. with the most painful experience i had in life you know mm -hmm. it's like every experience has a gift and um, it's a way of looking at life and it's my way it's not the way it's my way it's how i see life and my invitation with my work is not like oh follow what i say it's like find your way go inside there to go inside trust it's possible it's possible it's not the monster that we fear go inside and find what is your way to say yes to life and drink the juice of it that is what i love to do and that's what keeps me going in that field for mm. how long i don't know because it's always changing who knows if i will be doing that the coming years but now i love it <laughs> nice nice well the silence is nice too huh yeah so when ah, we talk and then we just experience mm. this flow of energy in the body mm. being inspired by this conversation this moment mm. it's also so important to learn to appreciate just the taste of this moment I enjoy it very much. <laughs> well, it's lovely. To, it's lovely to talk to you, Pavita. Lovely to talk to you. Pavita. The same. The same. Enjoyed very much, Devaraj. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a very nice conversation. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So, uh, for anyone watching who's interested to check out Pavita's workshop, then I will leave a link in the description below. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you.